I'll throw it out. I have I'll a little piece of it. a little bit coarse, so bear with me. Um, but I just wanted to thank you guys it's for coming so out neat. today. Um, I, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, when we got this started, you know, we were very excited about it, and I'm especially excited about the speakers we have this morning. Um, you know, Ellen Gonick, who is going to be our first presenter. She is. If you if you give context to it, Coldwell Banker is the number one real estate company in the state of New Jersey. And that's not me being biased. That's me looking at real statistics and saying, okay, like out of how many transactions are done in New Jersey, Cobalt Banker sells the most of them. Out of the almost 5,000 agents that we have in New Jersey, Ellen Gonick is the number one agent in terms of solo agents. Woo! So, <laughs> um, to give further context to that, she sells over $100 million worth of real estate a year. It's pretty incredible. Last year. So kudos <laughs> exactly. to She also has an awesome, awesome, awesome personality to boot. So I, uh, I'm very excited to hear her speak. I'm going to hand the mic over to her in one second. Just to give you a lay of the land today, um, I realize that this, this room's going to fill up. We have 250 people signed up. Um, so thank you guys for being here. And unfortunately, we are not immune to what's going on in the rest of the world. And what I mean by that is there's supply chain issues everywhere. So when I say that, we actually have a projector that's broken. And we've had it broken for a couple months now because the parts that are coming, or the projector is coming from China and like not arrived. So I apologize for those of you sitting on the side of the room. Mm -hmm. um, for Ellen, for the purpose of Ellen's presentation, we don't necessarily need you guys to like take notes on slides. Most of it's spoken. Uh, but you know, for Lindsay's and for myself, what I'm going to try to do is get a, a link that we'll put up that you could actually download it on your phone if you wanted to like look through the slides. I'm going to work on that. We'll see if it happens. Um, in general, like we're you know, in terms of the time frame for the day, we're going to go um, from 10 o'clock, and we're starting a little bit late, but we're going to go from 10 o'clock to about 10:45. We'll take a 15-minute break give or take, depending on the timing of each speaker. Um, and then Lindsay will start us up at 11 o'clock, again, another 45 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, depending on how it goes. Um, and then I'll finish up at 12 o'clock, um, and then we'll have lunch after, starting at one. All right, so you will have some time in between, take phone calls, do what you need to do, use the bathroom. Um, and other than that, we're gonna get started. So Ellen, please join us, and uh, give a warm round of applause to Kill it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to grab my water. Does she have a slide Oh, I have that. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'll set that up for you. I, get started and I'll be your I promise you, you will not have to take notes during this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. You want me to click? Not yet. <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Click. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, pay attention. This is for you. This is our very own game show host, Pat Sajak. Mike, Mr. Mike Panessi. I want to congratulate Mike on his fourth daughter. Yeah. Please look carefully what I have up here for you. I know that's not me. <laughs> this is you with five girls. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's coming. That's coming. You keep doing that, this is what it turns into. I have three daughters, and this was a big move, mostly for your wife. But yes. yeah. Okay. You all set up here? Oh, Just what are we? Right. Do you want me to keep in your clicker? No, it's all right. Okay. Yes, come. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. No, wait. Here. Okay. This is uh, maybe the biggest thing that's ever happened in my life. Um, maybe not exactly in those words, but certainly not, never so many people um, are here to hear me speak. This happens to Lindsay all the time, but not to me. So I appreciate you being here. 
Um, I hope to take an Oscar today. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, at 11 p.m. last night, uh, while I was watching the Golden Globes, I realized how completely unprepared I am, just like those people who win and they're like, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know. Well, I knew and I still didn't prepare in time. Um, so, but I usually wing my whole life as a, a wing, so that's what I'll do. All right. I specifically asked to go before this princess so that she doesn't steal my thunder or my trophy. Um, but seriously, you have no choice. You have to sit through me to listen to Lindsay. <laughs> So this is how I captured you. <laughs> um, Lindsay, I've watched you grow since you were like somewhat little. I'm so proud of you. This is, I'm really hoping that my kids follow in your footsteps. <laughs> uh, 40 under 40, by the way, that in itself is making me nauseous, but okay. Um, <laughs> all right. This is a good cake, by the way. Splurge makes it. Um, success in real estate, sorry, I'm gonna be all over the place. Just keep up. <laughs> success in real estate depends on your cake. And what I mean by that is friendly farming. You know, we're always told to farm and to reach out to our contacts. Friendly farming could be done in all layers of your life. The older you are, the more layers you have. Obviously, I have many layers. <laughs> um, when, I when I was younger, I imagined to have this glorious life where I would just go from ski resort to ski resort and live six months at a time there. Um, my biggest move, besides my parents immigrating, but my biggest move was from West Orange to Livingston. Um, I do live in a section called Riker Hill. That's my mountain. but. Um, the reason why I mentioned that is because it turned out for real estate that that was a good thing for me because my cake is dense. I can reach out to my high school friends, to my college friends, etc., and they will buy real estate for me. This is one of the reasons why I'm successful and I'm sure a lot of you are as well. Of course, if I went to school much further away, that wouldn't be the case. But in my case, the fact that I never left New Jersey kind of worked out for me. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of a background because I'm sure you hear the accent and you're like, where is she from? Here we go. <laughs> the motherland. I was born many, many years ago in Moscow. <clears throat> uh, at the time it was uh, the Soviet Union. Um, I'm the only child, as many of us were, uh, in the Soviet Union, and uh, it was a good childhood. I was oblivious to the rest of the world, and, uh, um, you know, my parents loved me, and my parents were educated, and they were encouraging me to study well, and whatever. I was 11 years old. I just remember skipping and hopping and you know, having enough food on my plate, which by the way, talking about Soviet Union is not always the case. Um, okay, my parents left the Soviet Union when they had a chance because there's really no prospects in the Soviet Union and I'm not gonna go into the history of it, but I was part of the immigration from the Soviet Union in 1979 and I landed in Orange, New Jersey. There we go. <laughs> The year was 1979, and uh, my family, it's the three of us, we settled in a one-bedroom apartment in Orange, New Jersey. Let me tell you, nothing glamorous. But let me tell you, it teaches you to want things and to work for things and to, um, to be ambitious in life. I didn't know that at the time, but I can say that now. Um, I spoke no English, I spoke French. That was, a, for many of us, was a second language in Russia. So I learned English by watching Three's Companies and Tom and Jerry. <laughs> so I would, you know, anytime I would uh, want to say like, oh, you know, during this commercial, but I didn't know the word commercial because they referred to it as 
messages, you know, like, we'll be back after this messages. I'm like, you know that message on TV? This is where I saw that. Um, <clears throat> my parents are go-getters, as I uh, mentioned before. It's, uh, it's, I don't want to say easy to be go-getters, but if you have no one else to depend on, you do what you have to, and that's what they did. So I learned from them. And um, most of us here can relate to my story, not so much, may maybe not from the immigrant perspective, but from a perspective is we are completely on our, on our, on our own. Um, we generate our own business. We know what we need to do and not to do. And um, I have no idea where I'm going with this. That's fine. Um, okay. Okay. This is my undergrad. Um, I have a degree in economics from Drew University. God only knows how I graduated. I was a party girl. I made friends with people who sat to the right and to the left of me, and uh, that's how I passed most of my tests. I, <laughs> once in a while, while I'm speaking to clients, I'll think of a good economic word, and I'll say, this is an outlier, and then I'm like, damn, good thing I went to school that day. <laughs> um, although you only need a high school diploma to become a real estate agent, which, by the way, was really a surprise to me, because I thought that test was really hard. <laughs> and I'm like, God, I meet so many dumbasses in this industry, and how the hell did they pass this test? It was hard. Um, so, but, it helps. It, it helps me. It helps me because in the area that I live in and the people that I deal with, uh, you, want, you want respect from your clients. And uh, if they feel that you can't put two words together, like I'm doing right now, um, but they tend not to give you a listing, for example. So um, throwing in uh, economic words every once in a while helps, um, especially when people now ask me to predict the market. Oh, I have a really good one for that. <laughs> they don't know 50% of the words I'm using, so it's good. Um, I, I, as I said, I, of course, graduated in four years because my parents threatened not to pay for any more schooling. Uh, I pulled a lot of all-nighters, like I did for this, by the way. Um, so, but this is one of my layers. This is where I'm still friends with my with my schoolmates and, you know, 30, 40 years later, oh good, my entire office is coming in completely late. Ah, nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, anyway, just another layer. Uh, uh, not just another layer, they're actually my friends, but uh, it helps in this industry for sure. My first job out of college, Johnson & Johnson. Yes, you're looking at it correctly. <laughs> I was a private interpreter for the J&J &J Company Group chairman. Um, what that meant is that every time he had anyone coming from, it wasn't a Soviet Union anymore, at that point it was Russia, but from Georgia, from Armenia, from all the ex-Soviet republics, they needed me to be with them at dinner. At 21 years old, I visited the most lavish restaurants in New York City, and it is disrespectful not to drink vodka during these dinners. <laughs> so, because my Russian is of an 11-year-old, it was quite interesting for me to be translating uh, for a group of drunk people who are insisting on me joining them um, uh, in drinking. Um, this is the, that was the highlight of my job. The low light of my job was to translate the usage of tampons versus pads in every republic, ex-Soviet republic. I know how many women are menstruating and what they're expecting for the next 10 years. It's great. Another... Another aspect of this, you're not going to find this funny, but I crack up every time I think about this. So these ministers of health would come from these ex-Soviet republics. They have no money, and Johnson & Johnson would give them some money to 
shop, it was still not, you know, uh, Short Hills Mall material. So we would wind up sitting, or I would wind up sitting for three hours in Sears while they would try on light blue polyester suits and come out and show me because I was their personal shopper. I was a translator for them. Um, yeah, but then I always got a little something on the side in polyester as well. <clears throat> okay. All right. What do those two things have in common? Um, 11 years after my family landed here, we have 35 people on one plane arriving in the US, all relatives on my mom's side and my dad's side. My dad had said to me, I'm now out of college, I'm a um, couple of years into Johnson & Johnson. My dad said, I will give you money if you open up a, a, a business that could employ them while they learn English and then get jobs in their own professions. My dad's, you know, he's considered a saint in our family uh, for that reason. So um, at that time, which was about 1991, remember the big salad episode from uh, Seinfeld? Okay, that made the big salads um, popular. Frozen yogurt was also, TCBY if you remember, was uh, a big thing. So this is what I did. I opened up a cafe in Upper Montclair, busiest corner there, and my relatives started working with me there. They very quickly left me because they're way too educated for this job, but this is, we ran this cafe for 10 years, which was our lease was four, and I became the Archie Bunker of Upper Montclair. <laughs> Everybody knew me, and, um, and I knew them. So Bobby Brown Cosmetics, Bobby and I, we used to exchange, we used to barter makeup for salads for her family. She has three boys. She gave me and did my makeup for my, my wedding for that matter. So uh, Olympia Dukakis was right up the street. So I met a lot of very interesting characters in Upper Montclair. However, after a few years, as exciting as it is for a young, you know, I was 21 uh, when I first started in this job. So. Um, as exciting as it was at first, I very quickly lost interest and instead I went to NYU. I went to NYU for hospitality management. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to wear pretty dresses and get dressed every day instead of being behind the counter in a local cafe. Um, this is where I learned to be hospitable. <laughs> We were taught how to speak nicely to people. But, um, it, was, it was great. For two years, it was great going out. That's not true, I didn't go out for two years because I very quickly found out that I was pregnant. So, um, but until I found out I was pregnant, I had a great time going out in the village. Um, another great layer in my life, of course. Uh, still keep up with, uh, with some of my friends from there and uh, again, I mean, I guess the only takeaway from everything I'm saying is if you are liked, that's key, by the way, you have to be liked and you have to like the people. But anybody that you keep in touch with, if you're doing this for a living, let them know that you're doing this for a living. Let them know if you are becoming successful. Every little bit helps. And because in our area, at least in my area, every other person has a real estate license. And some of them just think it's opening the doors. That's what I thought when I went to get a license. But um, not so many people stick with it. Um, and when your friends realize that you are becoming successful or, or have a, a achieved some kind of a success, they will use you if they're in the area. So that's just, you know, the reason why I bring that up. The Waldorf Astoria Hotel. This is what my first job was out of college. I was on three hours of sleep. I had a four months old baby. Um, between the commute and uh, the nursing, wow, it was, I, I have no idea how I survived. Um, just like in the show Hotel, I had to, not only I, all of my colleagues who were managers had to solve all kinds of mysteries 
Like there's, you get a call from the suite that's $5,000 a night. Hi, there's a turd in my toilet. <laughs> How do I know it's not your turd? We want you to comp the night. Like literally, am I arguing with them that it's not his turd? So whatever. So, and then you start recognizing the names like, I remember you're the turd guy. That's, <laughs> um, I have a very funny, very quick anecdote. So had a baby and invested like all the other professional women in those double breast pump. As you can see, no topic is off. Like I will discuss anything. And um, Bill Clinton was staying uh, in the hotel. This is where the, the White House uh, stays when in the city. The Secret Service took apart my breast pump and couldn't put it back together. <laughs> Girls, what happens to us after about three hours of not pumping? Oh, that was a great day for me. I was running a fever and all that afternoon. Um, anyway, but good story. <laughs> okay. I had, a great, I had great help with my babies until I didn't. I had a nanny. I was working all the time. My husband was in the city working all the time. And uh, it turned out that our nanny is an alcoholic. <laughs> and we just, we just froze because we trusted her. And then how do you trust the next person? I quit Waldorf Astoria. I had to quit. Um, still a great layer, though. Uh, one of the nannies that I had later on, the non-alcoholic one, I sold her house in Chester. <laughs> Okay, I am not the kind of person who can sit at home and have lunches and shop all day, so I quit the Waldorf Astoria and then I started teaching chess. This is going back to my Russian roots. Uh, in Russia we had three channels, they were all showing communist news. So you read a lot and you played chess a lot. And that's what I did as a kid. Um, it also looks great on the resume because when people are interviewing me for positions, they will always ask me about this. Um, and I remember one of the interviews that I had, it wasn't for Waldorf by the way, but uh, one of the interviews that I had, uh, in order to get the job, I had to beat the guy in chess and I did, thank God. But, uh, <laughs> that, that was my, um, uh, that was my test. My, er some of my earliest transactions in the beginning in real estate were, from my, uh, the parents of the students of my chess classes. So, you know, again, another layer. Okay, years 2008. Market crashes, my husband loses his job. And we're together all the time. <laughs> all the time. So ladies, you know what that means. I need to get the fuck out of the house. <laughs> what to do? One of my friends, who's still a good friend of mine, who's still a realtor, just not with Coldwell Banker, calls me and says, let's go get our licenses. I'm like, what, Amy, how, we can't, the market just crashed. She's like, let's go, we'll just eat lunch at brokers open houses. I'm like, okay, I'll be out of the house and I'll save my family money. Um, that's how I got into real estate, by the way, is exactly that. I didn't really think about this before, especially in 2008, and, um, so I went to school in 2008, 2009, I got my license. And right now on LinkedIn this morning, I was congratulated for my work anniversary. So I guess it's been 14 years. Uh, oh, I already did all of that. I became a realtor. Um, and it's funny because the same husband was snickering like, oh yeah, that's what the world needs is another realtor. Well, fucking, I'm gonna be the best fucking realtor I can be just to shut you up. Um, you know, we all have different driving forces. So I remember when I was a little kid and I really didn't wanna study and my father would found an approach to me like, you're gonna be that girl who like sells pocketbooks on the streets, you know, or like say something ridiculous to me like, no, I won't, no, I won't, I'm gonna succeed, I'm gonna be better than you. And this is the same approach I had with my husband. So um, I, I did the best that I can. 
So let's talk about our whys. I know you've had this before in many different classes or considerations when you are talking about real estate. Who is my why? Why do I do this? Besides the fact that I cannot not do this at this point, but when I first started doing, this is my why. I have three girls and I have a Toby. <laughs> my youngest girl is here, Farragonic. She's home on vacation from University of Miami, as if that's not a vacation. <laughs> My Kayla is 26 years old. She's finishing up law school. It sounds glamorous. It sounds like, wow, you really have it together. Kayla went to University of Colorado. Anybody knows what that means for four years? Okay. Yes, yes, she was skiing at the same time as other stuff. Uh, she graduated, bummed around a little bit, went to Thailand to teach English, which was really funny because I didn't even know she spoke English well enough, <laughs> but apparently better than, you know, the people in Thailand. Delaney, this picture is of her when she was uh, 13 years old because she won't let me take any other pictures. She moved out to LA. She's, she's doing great. She loves it out there. Hi. I actually cannot understand that, but that's, that's <laughs> next month. Next month conversation. Um, why do, why? Why are they my wives besides the fact that they're my children? Because they are insane with my credit card. <laughs> and I will tell you that I have a very Russian approach to raising kids. I don't BS, I don't, you know, I'm pretty, I'm not so strict, but I am, I'm not a pushover, let's just put it this way. I'm going to tell you a quick story, and this is going to be more important than anything you learn about real estate. My middle daughter, Delaney, went off to college, <clears throat> uh, University of Arizona, and in August, she spent $100 in CVS. CVS is the nicest store in Tucson, Arizona, by the way. <laughs> in September, she spent another $100. In October, she spent another $100. In November, she didn't ask me for money for CVS. Why, Delaney? Oh, me and my roommate, we just went to CVS, we just spent $400 each. I said, Wh where'd you get the money from? Well, she goes out with this guy, and after the date, he takes her to wherever store she wants. And CVS is the nicest store. So I'm like, is that like prostitution? What is, what is that? I didn't really understand what that meant. So, just in case, I got her her own credit card, and I said, please don't ever date anyone for CVS. <laughs> it turned out that what this was, and I learned this with uh, Life with Lisa Lane, it's called sugardaddy.com. And as we are sitting and watching this, a couple of years later, with my youngest, Farah, who's in the audience, she her eyes are popping open. Oh my God, they're getting a Louis Vuitton bag and they're getting this and that and this. Here's a credit card, Farah. Please don't ever date any men for a Louis Vuitton bag. So anytime I try to cut her off, she brings up sugardaddy.com. <laughs> Mike, you understand where this is all heading for you. Okay. <laughs> so parents of girls, be careful. Um, I just saw a movie on the plane called Molly's Game and something, 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 pretty, pretty good uh, movie. And then uh, her lawyer, who has a teenage daughter, asked Molly, the main character, uh, how do I, what, what do I do to make sure I don't lose her in this world? And she goes, whatever they offer her, double it. <laughs> I'm tripling it. <laughs> okay, that's my why. Okay, let's get to real estate. Um, we all rely on our friends. We have to, friends and family. If we had a friend who owns a dealership, car dealership, do we think that we would get a little bit of a better deal than a stranger walking off the street? That's pretty much what my life is like. I'm friends with so many people in my town that everyone expects that they're going to have a little friendly discount. And you know what? It's okay because they're loyal to me. 
I don't have to fight. I don't have to pay a referral fee. I know that they will only use me. And for that, they get a little something. So considering the referrals that we get from each sale and the sign in front of the house, don't be afraid to give a little something. Like I said, don't, don't be petty. Okay. Uh, this happens to be my life. This is a bar. <laughs> I used to play soccer. I am friends with all of my soccer mates. I still play volleyball, tennis. That's a high school meeting. We meet a lot of friends from through our kids as well, uh, of course. Um, uh, my first deal as a realtor, as period, was my friend's little sister. My friend is here with us. Please, round of applause. <laughs> That's right. I, I knew you were coming. I put you in here. Um, yeah, so her little sister was in her 20s, needed a house. She didn't know any better but to use me. So that was my first. And then I have a lot of many stories like that that just kept going. And two years into being in this industry, in my own little town, I became the number one buyer's agent. That's really just coming from doing open houses and really the um, recommendations of your friends, for sure. There, there's no other um, way. Try to join as many things as you can that you enjoy. You don't have to be a bad tennis player like I am, for example, but um, those relationships evolve eventually and all of a sudden I'm not in my 30s I'm in my 50s and I've just spent 20 years with these people and that's how life goes ladies change your last name if you're married to match your kids names that's the only way we're known in town uh, people don't know my maiden name they only know what my kids last names are if your kids are not liked in town change it back <laughs> okay um, all right, this is really my secret to success. I treat all of my clients like they're mental patients. <laughs> and sometimes they say the most asinine things to me. And instead of getting angry, I'm thinking it's because they're mental. <laughs> they can't help it. Um, I treat my friends and colleagues like that also. <laughs> it's true. It's my secret. I do. I treat you all like mental patients. <laughs> um, so you have to, what does that mean? That means that you, you have to forgive them for whatever stupid things that they say. You have to forgive them and um, even those people need a roof over their head and you are there to find them despite what challenges they create for themselves. We also forget sometimes, or all the time, that they're going through stuff. People sell homes sometimes for good reasons because they're upgrading and sometimes for bad reasons. Sometimes it's a death, it's a divorce, or just a couple who's been in their house for the last 30, 40 years and they just cannot picture themselves elsewhere we have to hold their hand. We have to be their best friend for three months. The key is how to cut them off after three months <laughs> because they keep calling and they keep asking advice and they start inviting you for uh, brisses and weddings and funerals and you have your own life to leave so you just have to drop them. <laughs> um, a another very good one. People come to me that I've never met before. My first conversation is, this is what I would do if this was my house. This was my house, this is the price that I put on. If this was, uh, if I'm looking for a house, I would never buy a house on this street. I always tell them like it is, like I would do it. And that builds a very quick trust. And when I represent buyers, for example, 50% of the time I, talk them out of buying that particular house because my fear is that in five years they're going to come to me because they're moving to California 
and I'm going to be like, oh, that's a shitty street. I'm not selling a house on the street or you can't get your money back. I never want to be in that position. So at least I have to verbalize it. And if they really want to buy it anyway, well, then, you know, screw them. Um, I hear a lot from clients who come to me from others. Like, you know what, I was working with another agent. I always ask them not to give me the name of who else they were working with because I'm afraid it's like one of my friends. Um, but I, I hear stories about them being pushy or being super encouraging to buy any one particular house and that turns them off. You walk around like you don't need the salary. No, take your time. Take five years to buy a $500,000 house. Absolutely. I want to spend all that time with you. Um, again, you, you talk about good investment, bad, bad investment. If you don't know something, just say, I don't know it. I don't know. You have to look confident enough in the things that you know so that when you say that you don't know something, they appreciate the fact that you're not making shit up. So... Educate and empower your clients. This happens all the time. I have uh, just um, a house that I sold uh, a month ago. I showed them a house. They're like, oh, no, it needs so much work. I'm like, you don't know how great this house is. I showed them five more homes that were way worse. And it's not that I chose them. It's because there's nothing else on the market. I chose them. And they're like, oh, this is way worse. I'm like, exactly. They bought the first house. But sometimes people come to me and they're like, we went to an open house and we saw this house and we want you to represent us. I didn't suffer enough with them yet. I'm, I feel like I need to suffer a little bit more, show them some more, and I drag them for a few more days to show them others so that they are 100% sure that this is what they want. They appreciate it and it makes them feel good that they didn't rush into a decision. So empower your clients. Make them, I use words like this all the time. I will make sure that you know as much as I do, which is not much, so it takes you know, it's pretty fast. Um, I say this to myself all the time. Protect your peace at all costs. What does that mean? Sometimes you get caught up in the patient's uh, life and they start arguing uh, over inspection issues that are $500. And I'm counting the minutes and the hours I'm spending on this. I'm like, it's not worth it. And all of a sudden I'll get up and like a hero, I'll be like, I will pay for it. Shut the hell up everybody, I will pay for it. That's it, this conversation is over. It's not that I have money to give away every two seconds. It's that it pays back. Like I said, you look like a hero and uh, you make them feel bad because they feel petty, and they are, and, um, and you save time from being aggravated. <clears throat> um, it's basically the same idea as when our kids were little and we used to say, choose your battles. This is exactly it. Choose your battles. If you can end a bad conversation that even if you didn't have to wind up paying that $500, but then people walk away with a bad taste in their mouth, it's not worth it. It's better to spend the $500 so that, again, you look like a hero, everyone feels great, and then they write a great review for you. Um, okay, this is even more important. What is this? This is about colleagues. Most of my Colleagues are my friends. Hello. Hello, Livingston. I love that. I love that we love each other. I love that we're in the office and we help each other. I'll get to our director who directs us. I'll get to that in a little bit. But we are here to make sure that we all have a salary an income. What does that mean? In the last couple of years where it's been insane in the industry and we had 10, 20 offers on any shit shack that comes along, if one of your friends slash colleague who knows what they're doing is putting in an offer and you know that this person is going to come to a closing table, which is, of course is the most important thing for the seller, you make sure that that person, unless their offer is so low, it doesn't even matter. But if their offer is in the top, 
you recommend that to your sellers because your sellers are looking to you to give advice and you want to make yourself feel happy by having a relatively stress-free transaction and how do you make it stress-free you give the business to someone who knows what they're doing and if you're lucky you're friends with those people you know who you are okay um this is just for me specifically i have a lot of friends in this industry they're all a little bit afraid of me which is good um i don't I'm all very friendly unless things turn to be unfair and then I get my claws out and I become Russian. <laughs> so I don't abuse it, I don't take advantage of it, but I definitely don't let people push me or my clients around, for sure. It all has to be fair. That is the most important part. Even if I represent the sellers, it has to be fair to the buyers also and vice versa. My job is to walk away from a transaction, even if I represented only one side, for both players to feel that things were done uh, fairly. Many times, and now I, that I'm in the business for 14 years, I've had situations where I represented only the seller, never met the buyer, and then a few years later the buyer would call me and say, you were so fair, we want to hire you to sell the house. So it's nice, it, it pays back. Um, all right, are you guys almost, oh, Mike, I'm going so, f so, it's okay? All right. Um, so, ah, uh, I can't do this alone. This is my assistant. Do you see how she's giving me the middle finger? <laughs> she does that every morning. <laughs> Carrie, Carrie. we have each other's back we are both moms we both live in town we go through personal stuff all the time just like the rest of us kind of have to cover for each other and throughout the years we became friends and i love you and i you know i i know that i'm not afraid that uh, carrie's going to meet with my clients and my clients are going to be like where'd you pick her up from <laughs> most of the time it's like oh she's so nice I'm like I know we balance each other out she's nice and I'm not <laughs> um, all right this is our Jerry this is our Jerry Jacob get up Jerry When I first got my license, I was in Remax because they gave me a better split because I had no business. And um, I met with a few people from um, Livingston offices because I needed to be in Livingston. I understood that I was gonna be somewhat, at least busy, maybe not successful, but at least busy. And I needed to be in Livingston so that um, I could get coverage when I needed to. I made Jerry take me out to lunch at least five times. <laughs> <laughs> like make a decision already I'm like nah let's do another lunch um, there was never going to be anyone but you Jerry I just wanted the free lunch um, he encourages us he's fair to everyone in the office he stops cat fights in our office which we also enjoy and he stops them um, he's the most sensible man I've ever been married to <laughs> just kidding he has a wife um, oh, get up, wife, get up. <laughs> Sue Jacob. Um, and in my personal situation, I ask for advice all the time. I just basically need a sounding board, which Jerry is. And um, Jerry keeps me out of jail <laughs> because he says, like, no, that's not legal. I'm like, come on. <laughs> I can just do that. He's like, no. No, you can't. So, thank you for my freedom, Jerry. <laughs> um, oh my God, that may be, so, okay, yeah. So my last one is to basically, to wrap it up, uh, this, I just saw this a couple of weeks ago from Tom Ferry. When people say, 
work life balance it's all bullshit there's no balance there's no balance we sell to our friends our clients become our friends which allows them to text at 11 o'clock or midnight um i don't turn off my phone because i have three daughters who might be on sugardaddy.com so i can't turn off the phone um so if i'm up i will answer i don't have this moral conversation with them, like, how dare you text me at 11 o'clock? They text me because they want to get an answer probably tomorrow morning, and if I'm up and I answer, all of a sudden I get an amazing review afterwards, like, Ellen is always available. Well, yes, because I don't turn off my ringer. Um, if you love what you do, and I love, I love what I do. I love real estate, I love dealing with people, I love going into the office. I love the fact that during the pandemic, when most of my friends were losing their minds, I was an essential worker. <laughs> I put myself out there every day in like five masks and I never stopped working. And because otherwise I would have gotten depressed myself. So do the best you can with um, balancing it. But I will tell you that every vacation I'm on the phone, my boyfriend knows it. We are, by the way, no husband because, you know, he made fun of me. Um, <laughs> so um, he knows, and, and sometimes we have, uh, he remembers names of clients who ruined our vacation in, you know, in St. Thomas or whatever. Um, wherever we go, we have a name associated with it who ruined our vacation. But it's all right, he's been trained. Um, that's it, that's all I got. Thank you. I'm going to leave you up here for a couple more minutes. Yeah. we have any questions? No? <laughs> Nobody wants to know What's how to sell tampons? It's an open book. What's the What's That's the right. Ask? I covered everything. Um, I, I honestly, I really do appreciate it. I, I think that it, it, I'm just, I was reflecting on this like while I was sitting over there. We have a question to me once again. Um, and I feel like, did I get cut, cut off? Or not? Um, I feel like my takeaway, and I knew this already, but is, you know, it, it, you can't help but like you. Like, there's just a likability factor to the realness. That's what all men say. That's what all men say. But I really do think that it's true. I think that this business is very much about likability. And, you know, if you can get across to your clients that you're genuine and that, you know, you're bringing them to, you know, the realness, side, which you clearly do, like, that's, that's more than half the battle. So thank you. Yeah, I know. Again, you're a credit to our office, and we do appreciate you. But question I have, the most difficult client that you ever had that you converted to a transaction. What's the story? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just had one. I don't, ha I don't have to dig deep. <laughs> <laughs> the same house that I just referred to that closed last week, um, where I brought the buyers the first time, and they said it wasn't for them, and then they wind up buying it. Well, I also represented the sellers there. Wow, those, you know, sometimes you have like one patient and then the other one is reasonable, but sometimes you have both patients and then it becomes really difficult. And um, he would, once in a while, he would scream at me. I'm like, who, who the hell do you think you are? Nobody screams, I mean, many people scream at me, but like not just, you know, without apologizing. So how did I deal with this? I Googled his name. <laughs> Now I understood everything. So he was, he had issues with the law. Um, I have no idea where I'm going with this. I'm, I'm always trying to find an angle of why are they this way? And sometimes when they're especially difficult, I'm thinking to myself, how difficult is it for them to live the life that they live? And then I start feeling bad for them and I just sweep it under the rug and just do what I need to do. Um, definitely rely on your attorneys to split the, uh, those difficult conversations so you're not the only one delivering the news like you have to, you know, fix certain things and nah, I'm not going to do any. Yeah, okay, talk to your attorney. So, I don't know if I answered that question, but yeah. You can keep the mic. Any other questions? Please, shout it out. Hey, uh, hey I'm uh, David Kirk. Hey, David. Hey. Um, so, it'll bring career, bring that, uh, Bill, can you talk a little about what your current efforts are in terms of 
outreach. Obviously, you have a great resource base coming in, but you know, what are you doing social media, mailing? I yeah. Do you still attend open houses? Yeah. What do you do to reach out to people who are not coming to you? Yeah. Um, whenever I have a listing, I always try to do my open house. One of the reasons is because I promised that during the interview with the sellers. I feel that in the towns that I sell in, I can be us like no one else. And hence, I always tell them that unless they list and I have, if I have a vacation, obviously I'm not doing it, but if I don't have too much on my plate, I'm going to schedule myself for an open house almost every weekend. I meet a lot of buyers there. It's funny that right now when there's no uh, inventory, I have buyers who are calling to interview me if they want to use me or not. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> You'll be lucky if I call you with a house. What are you interviewing me for? Um, I definitely do mailers. Again, I specialize in, in Livingston and the surrounding areas. So I, if I want listings in Livingston, I do mailers. It's expensive. It's definitely expensive. But sometimes people will say to me, oh yeah, of course I've seen your name. I've gotten your postcards. So um, if you do this several times a year and then put your face on the back of a bus and then put your face on the on the um, billboard, people catch on who you are. Um, it's expensive. That's all I have to say. Um, Carrie, what am I missing? Social media, yeah. Yeah. Social media. It's really difficult. Zillow sucks right now. I get uh, the, the once in a while when I get a call, it's for a house that's already under contract. And for some reason, Zillow doesn't know that. Um, just go, remember that picture I had of a bar? Go to the bar. <laughs> Do some farming there. Um, hold on one second. Uh, Will, did you have something? I saw you raising your hand. Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Will? Uh, yes, hi. I got dressed for you. <laughs> you looked so dapper last time. I'm like, God damn it, I can't just wear jeans after Will. <laughs> go on, Will. <laughs> Question about the financials. Obviously, you own Livingston. There's a lot of people you've met through, you know, school and everything that you're doing in town. How much are you budgeting to put back into the business from your income right now? Oh. Carrie, <laughs> <laughs> I barely know how to turn on the computer. I, 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 I don't budget. I'm not organized like you. I don't, I don't have a budget. Sometimes. Carrie will show me like a, a eight by 11 postcard that's going out and like I almost, my jaw dropped. It's expensive. But I, I go with my gut feeling. I don't, I don't budget. Um, any, other, any other pressing questions, please? Hi. Hi. Um, I, I totally relate to almost everything that you said, just about everything you said. And, um, but you, you seem to be so inspired and you had your why, but is there, like, has there been times where you just slowed down and you needed to get picked up and how did you do that? The question is how do you get re-going when you, you feel down? Like, yeah. You know, when, you're, when business is tough, like how do you get yeah. restarted? Yeah. yeah. You know, one of the things that I say to myself and to my colleagues and to my buyers is that we sell a product that is necessary in life. Most of us, and, and I know that's not all of us, but most of us sell first family homes, not vacation homes necessarily. People will always need a roof over their heads. People will always need to educate their kids. So even when we're slow and there's not enough inventory to sell, it has to pick up. There's no, there's no way, right? Just logically, it has to pick up. So after the last three years that we've had, which were ridiculous, um, I already knew it, there has to be a slowdown. First of all, because I can't work like that. I work like a robot. So I am, I am scheduling vacations <laughs> for myself. I am scheduling things knowing that it's going to come back because at the end of the day, in our area, there are more buyers than sellers. The second that there's homes, you need to jump on it. And that's another thing is, if you can 
this is not to answer your question, but as in general, if you can make some money because the way the universe turned out and there's a chance for us to make some money, hustle, do the best that you can, skip a vacation, skip a weekend. Sometimes I work 40, hour, 40 days without a day off and then I'll take a week off. And then, you know, so I, I don't miss any parties that my friends have. I don't miss any vacations that my friends have, but I will miss weekends. I'm always available starting, you know, 8 p.m. As my, far, my, my um, daughter Farrah always says, like, my mom's clubbing somewhere, you know. I'm not actually clubbing, but I, I will not. I have enough energy to work this hard and then go out. It energizes me because if I just come home and plop on my couch, then why am I doing all of this? So to answer your question, we're not selling a product that maybe will be irrelevant in a few years. This will always be relevant and we just have to wait for the inventory to pick up. Unless we have any, we have one more. I just want, I was going to be quiet, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what I will say about Ellen is she's the most driven person I've ever seen. That's the secret behind all of this whole thing. I've never, I've managed thousands of agents, great, great, great agents. She's just driven. She needs to be number one. She needs to be number one. As it turned in, out, in, I didn't set it out. In yeah. everything. So, <laughs> in other words, you know, she became number one in the office. I told her she's number two, number three. It's like, <laughs> she became number one in the town, became number one in the county, became number one in the company. For years, she'd be like three, four, I think, you did great, you third in the company. Not good enough. <laughs> it's driven like she needs to breathe air. And that is, is with all the agents I've ever managed that were successful, one sitting over there, top agent in Middletown, they're driven, and that's the secret to all of it. If you're that driven, you'll find a way to get it done. Yeah. And surround yourself with good people. Yeah. A hundred percent. And you know, um, when I advertised that I was number one in Livingston, for example, and then I would say I'm number three in uh, the state, my friends are like, oh, I thought you were number one. Yeah. Like, no, it's the state, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so, I had to, so I had to catch up. Guys, thank you. Thank you for listening.